Previously on Unpacked. My pregnancy was super chilled. My daughter was born just five days before my wedding. I did not feel this joy that people described to me. I felt like, oh my goodness, I'm so going to disappoint this child. I was like, I'm going to crash my car into the barrier of this highway. I was feeling so worthless. Ditswanelo Sidurumane and fortunate Zungu Ludaga have both suffered from postnatal depression. This is part two of the conversation. Let's unpack. I think that's the worst part is that and I've heard so many mothers say to me that, like, the fact that so many women have been giving birth for centuries mm, constantly yeah. plays in your mind. Yeah. And then you think, you know, what's, what's wrong with me that I can't do it? Mm. Or you're like, everybody goes through this, they're just quiet about it. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that there's a type of a secrecy within um, women being mothers with them sharing the realities of what happens? 100% yes. Yeah. Because... Only after I went to see my therapist, she actually wrote my mom an email mm. to tell her this. And then she came up with the news that, yeah, this does happen. I was like, wow. Mm. Wow. You know, I think, I think it's, it's a secret that's hidden by shame. Mm. Yeah. Because women are strong and... Mm. You know, we we can birth, we can create whole humans and birth them and keep them alive from our bodies. Mm. So, you know, why why would you be sad about wanting to end your life? It will pass. Mm. You you said you were angry. What were some of the other emotions that you were experiencing? Um, disappointment. I don't know if exhaustion is an emotion, but mm -hmm. um. I was, yeah, I was feeling let down. I was feeling let down by everybody, by myself. As in, like, them showing up for you? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Them showing up for me and the whole lockdown thing. I don't know who to blame for that. Mm. Um, yeah, people... Yeah, people were weird. They didn't phone to ask about me. They they phoned to ask about my child. Mm. I actually told them, can you stop that? I'm so, I so relate to you. I've told everybody that they must buy my child a cell phone and call him. <laughs> <Yes>. Same. <laughs> I mean, like, the, and, and I get it. It's, it's so, oh, man, like, my, my heart for you right now is just because, for me, it's still so fresh. Yeah. And I cannot imagine those, how alone you must have felt. Um, was there ever a point where you thought, I actually need to just call my therapist because I think there's something not right? No, I was even ashamed to phone her. Mm. And I told her this. She was like, it's her job, you know. And I'd been with her for so long, I want to say two years before mm. that, that I shouldn't be feeling shameful to go see her. Why do you think you felt ashamed? I think it's because I also wanted to portray this, I'm fine, I'm strong, um, I can do this, to everybody, mm. even to my therapist. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. When did you start experiencing feelings that were like, this is not okay? Um, I would say soon after the child was born, like almost immediately. Mm. Um, at first it was feeling of disappointed, disappointment in myself um, that, of course, um, I'm unemployed, the father of my kids is unemployed, two kids. Mm. Um, so there was that disappointment, but gradually it built up to depression. Mm. And um, like I mentioned, I've, went, I've been through a series of traumatic events in my life, so I thought there's nothing special about this one. Mm. You know, I'll be okay. But I then started feeling very suicidal. Mm. Um, and I didn't really want to die. 
But I was so overwhelmed. Um, like Dee mentioned, the baby wasn't sleeping. She was crying all the time. Um, like literally when I had to take a bath, I would make sure like the minute I put her on the bed, I'm like in and out of the bath because she wasn't sleeping. So I was exhausted. Um, I felt like a failure as well. Like this is not going to work. And then it started becoming thoughts of, okay, how do you do this? How do you end your life? Mm. Um, I remember one time I locked myself in the toilet. Um, you know, at the location, we have toilets outside mm. the house. Um, and then my husband was like, what is wrong? What's wrong with you? And I told him, like, I want to kill myself, but I don't want to. But the feeling and the, everything in me says, do it. Um, there's a railroad, a uh, rail track um, close to where we stayed. So I was like, I feel like if I don't lock myself into this toilet, I'll just go lie there and the train will just finish it off. Mm. Um, he then spoke to his father, who then came and fetched me um, and took me to Pretoria. But I think days later, I overdosed on pills. Mm. Um, I remember... Um, gaining consciousness um, and I was being put in, a, in, a, in an ambulance, being taken to hospital. So I was um, coming in and out of consciousness and then I got there, they did the whole draining thing. And luckily they said, um, it's nothing that could take my life, but it will damage me somehow. Mm. So it's the whole battling of emotions to that point where I'm like, I'm literally doing this now. Mm. Yeah. How, how did your depression manifest itself? I know we're speaking a lot about the feelings, mm. but um, what are some of the things that you would do or not do? So I'll give an example. Um, I've heard stories of women who will say when they were suffering postpartum uh, depression that their child would just cry and they would mm. just block the sounds out mm. or they would fantasize about just not having a child anymore. Sure. You know, so how did yours manifest itself? Mine was that I couldn't embrace my daughter. Mm. Um, I mean, when a baby cries, even if it's not my baby, my first thought would be to comfort that baby. Mm. Um, so I couldn't even comfort my own child. I couldn't connect emotionally with her. Mm. And I think that's why she was crying. I mean, I think, I don't know, but maybe that's why she, that's why she needed. Mm. And I wasn't available. I, I just couldn't find it in me to pour into her that way, the love and the care. But it was, mm. if I pour anything into her, maybe I'll pour everything that is wrong with me. Mm. So let me rather not. Mm. Yet her cries were a cry of, I need you. Mm. I need my mom. Mm. And that caused me to feel shame because with my son, I didn't have that. Yet with my daughter, I have that. So that made me feel like maybe I shouldn't do this. Mm. Because it's like I'm choosing one child over the other. And I know within me that is not the case. I love both my children, but I'm struggling to give myself to this child. And it's mm. not her fault. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you, you've touched on some very heavy things there. I think what you were saying is, uh, for me, that stands out for me, is that um, your daughter crying so much and you're not available mm -hmm. and how, you know, they say babies or children are mirrors of their parents, mm -hmm. that they, a lot of the communication is unsaid. Mm -hmm. um, so when you try to take your own life, did you consider what that would do to the fact to, to your children if you, had, if you had managed to do it? My thought was that they're better off without me. Mm. I'm just going to disappoint them because I grew up being told I'm a disappointment, I'm good for nothing. So I was like, I'm really not going to do this because mm. um, dropping out of varsity made me feel like, okay, I don't have any education, I don't have a job, so there's mm. nothing. You know, it's one way to say I have financial means to provide for a child, but you can't provide financially, you can't provide emotionally, then mm. what are you giving? Mm. So I was like, whoever's going to be left with my kids will probably do a much better job mm. than me. So it wasn't like, Bazuba right, no. It was mm. like, someone who's more able will fulfill it. Was there consideration for 
um, your daughter to go and stay where your son was staying? Um, with myself or the family, no. I think with the family, they felt like she deserves to be with me the same mm -hmm. way that um, my son had that opportunity. So I think mm -hmm. that's why maybe not. Um, so f I think for that one, and also, like I said, I've had this, I'm a survivor mentality. I am, I know that I am, but this time, um, I felt like I can do it. Yes, I didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, from your side, how did your depression manifest itself, like in real life? It didn't. Mm. That's why people couldn't tell. So you were you were I was high functional. functioning. Yeah, mm. Mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. But when I was alone, that's when. I mean, when I was alone in the car, that's when the thoughts would come. Like, just you're on the highway, 120 kilometers. If you even touch the barrier, your car will probably flip. Mm. Yeah. Did you ever have thoughts of hurting or not providing for your child? No. Mm. No. Did you ever have those thoughts? Um, hurting my child? No. Mm. Uh, but in terms of providing, I think it's like providing that love. Because mm. I know my child needed it, but I was like, I just don't know how to give it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Was was that also a part of, if what I can give is not good enough, I'd rather give nothing. Yeah, a lot, mm. a lot. Um, I thought, I think it's how we perceive ourselves mostly because I perceived myself as this person that I was told I was, the person who's unkind, who doesn't help others, the person, and those are all negative notions. I was like, maybe if I do give, I'll give that. So rather not. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did your ther what was the intervention to to now help deal with the situation? She offered me meds. She didn't tell me which meds she mm. would offer me. Mm. And I declined. I just said I don't I don't think I need them mm. right now. And she said okay, but I need to come back and see her every single week. Mm. And that's that's the path that we've been on. We still currently are on. I'm seeing mm. her on Monday. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Mm. And um, did that help you slowly um, heal from the, the headspace that you were in at the time? Uh, I, I don't know. I can't say for me that the depression is healed because mm. some days I still have thoughts of hurting myself and ending mm. my life. And I'm like, is it depression? Or is it still postpartum depression? Like, mm. I don't know the difference now because I have ne I've never had experiences like mm. this. I've never thought about hurting myself or ending my life. Um, so I think, and I think this is something she told me in our last session, that it's a lifelong commitment to do the work to heal mm. yourself. Mm. Mm. And I think that makes sense because... It's not like you suddenly snap out of it. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But have, is, are you feeling better? I definitely think I am feeling better, yeah. Mm -hmm. The tools that she has given me when I do use them mm -hmm. um, have helped, yeah. What are some of the tools that you are using to help you cope better? Journaling, mm -hmm. yeah. Journaling to me is like therapy without the therapist mm -hmm. there, yeah. When, What's your relationship with your daughter like now? My son. <laughs> your son, sorry. See, now I'm confusing girls and boys. <laughs> yes, with your son. It's stunning. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I love him so much. I'm obsessed with him. He's obsessed with me too. Mm. Yeah. I wouldn't change it for the world. Do you still feel guilty? Yes. Yeah. What, what are you feeling guilty about? I mean, I'm a present mom. I know that mm. for, for sure. Um... I make a mental note to spend 15 minutes with him without my phone there. Mm. Um, but I feel guilty about providing the best for him. Mm. You know, I think back on the things that, the opportunities I had in my childhood and I, I mean, it wasn't like a, a great childhood, but I had good opportunities mm. that I made use of and I would like to provide even more for him. Mm. And sometimes I just don't know how I'd be able to do that. Mm. And I feel terrible about mm. that. Mm. Mm. It, it's a tough one because 
it's also kind of subjective. You know, like how you measure yourself as I'm doing a great job. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you can tell us, like, have you ever had a moment where you're like, I'm a great mom, actually? Yes. So you do have the moments? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and are you balancing those moments with the times that you do feel like you're not, you're, you're not doing as, as well as you could be doing? I think I struggled the whole of the first year because mm-hmm. he's 18 months now. And now that he's a toddler, I'm like... No, I'm doing a good job. I've, I've got this. Like, mm. I can do it. I am doing it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And for you? Um, I think my relationship with my daughter is probably one that is a symbol of how one puts in the work and you get the benefits. Um, Maybe we can use this opportunity for you to tell us how you slowly climbed out of the space that you were in. So I... I didn't get diagnosed, but I mean, it was obvious that I, I attempted suicide, so there was something wrong. Mm. So the following day, I went and saw a social worker. Mm. At this time, I think my daughter was about six, seven months. Mm. Um, and when we had a great conversation. And in the whole conversation, we really unpacked my whole life and how my whole life has led up to this point of mm. me trying to do this. And of course, there was that shame of, not being successful in the suicide because I'm in the shame now of depression because it is a, it is stigmatized. Um, but I made a decision that day and I was like, okay, the good thing is that my daughter is still a baby. Mm. She will not remember me struggling to love her, to embrace her mm. and to pour that love into her. So if I work on myself, surely by the time she's able to see my relationship and read it mm. with her, she'll see something different. So that was my goal. And that Mm. really propelled me to work on myself. And um, today she is, what, 15 years old. Mm. She's my best friend. Um, I look at her and I look at how she perceives life and how brave she is in life. And I thank myself. I give myself a pat on the back and say, well done, because how you have healed has given her an opportunity to deal with with her own life instead of mm. dealing with, you know, her upbringing, you neglecting her and all mm. of that. So it's been, a, it's been an experience, it still is, but um, I can definitely say that years later, it was worth putting in the work. What were some of the factors that you think contributed to you feeling depressed when you were? Uh, being unemployed, mm. uh, that's a real one, and also, getting married young and not knowing what am I doing. Mm. Um, Also trying to run away from my past, Mm. you know, using one thing as a substitute for another instead of dealing with what the actual issue is. So what in your past do you feel like you were running away from? Neglect from Mm. my own childhood. Mm. Neglect and abuse. Mm. And um, so when I had an opportunity to get married, I was like, sure. I mean, yeah, at least I'll be out of that house. Mm. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. And I mean, it's a, uh, I think it's important for us to note that the, the contributing factors can be a myriad of things. Mm. Could be hormones, could be chemicals, and it can be many things. Mm. It's not necessarily that every woman that suffers postpartum depression um, had some childhood thing that she had to, to, mm. to deal with or was avoiding. Do you feel like there were other factors within you that contributed to how you were feeling? I think the biggest one was that my child was not planned. Yes. And at the time, I was unemployed too. Mm. And soon after I found out, I got a job as an au pair. Mm. And that is how I made the money to buy what I needed for Mm. the first six months, basically. Mm. And this was pre-COVID times, of course. There was mm. the there was a mama show that had like an expo of mm. you know things that you could buy at discounted prices, and mm. went there and stocked up on a lot of things. Mm. Um, I think that was a big one: N- not being employed, my child not being planned, um, and lockdown. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Would you say also uh, not having your mom with you contributed? Um, yeah, definitely. Mm. Not having my mom with me. Mm. Yeah. Because she would have been 
like you were saying, how oh, I'm feeling a bit tired. Can yes. somebody take the child? I didn't yes. have that, you yes. know. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, mothers are encyclopedias of of experience and information yeah. that no parenting book is going to mm. teach you or, or show you or anything like that. Mm. So now looking back at the postpartum depression, what do you think um, people should know uh, about your experience that can maybe highlight something that they could recognize and go, oh my gosh, I'm, I also am going through this? I think the biggest thing that moms or mom-to-be are told is like, you know, put together a nursery, which cot are you buying, blah, 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 which is great. I mean, mm. if that's your vibe, then go ahead and do that. But I think funds could be spent on a psychologist, mm -hmm. you know? Be because when you need her after giving birth, she's still going to be there. Mm. Your beautiful nursery, you're going you're gonna to hate it, being mm. depressed and sitting in a beautiful nursery. It's not going to help you in any way. Um, spending money on a postpartum doula, I did not even know these people existed, mm. which is basically like having your mom there, mm. you know. Um, these people come in, they cook your meals. If you have a pet, they feed your pet. If you've got other older children, they will look after the kids. Mm. They help with breastfeeding and stuff like that. So knowing what resources are available and rather spending money on that mm. than aesthetic things, I mm. think, would be great. I think that that is spot on. I think so many uh, people, I, I mean, I'm hearing about a post an after doula for mm. the first time with you telling me right now. And I wasn't aware that that is available. Um, and I think what you were saying about, you know, possibly redistributing your funds yeah. to more support and less about what looks cute. Because yeah. I know we get very excited about things yeah. that look cute, but in real life, on a day-to-day, -day, you might need other things more than that. Yeah, and I mean, your child's probably not going to be in that beautiful nursery until they're seven or eight months old. Yes. So... Yeah, yeah. Mm. And what can we take from your story that, you know, can assist somebody watching? I think since my child is older, is um, put in the work. Um, it may take one day to, you know, give you so much trauma, whatever it is that you go through as an individual, but it will take you a couple of years to overcome it. Mm. Um, I of, often look at depression because I've had a couple of incidents where I've like had to look eye to eye with my depression and I tell myself that I'm like a, pe a person who's an AA, you know, who's um, recovering from alcohol or any mm. other addiction. Mm. Depression is not different. So I need to be kind to myself and understand that it's, it's an everyday work that I need mm. to put in. And sometimes it's important to pull yourself back and remind yourself that I'm, I'm also human. Like, this is another human. I have no manual mm. in mm. how to raise another human. So being kind to myself and really put in the work. Um, I tell my kids that I'm sorry when I feel like I've done wrong because... I don't want them to be parents that will resent themselves. Mm. I want them to know that, okay, mommy made mistakes, mommy is sorry. Um, when mommy's not okay, mommy takes time off and maybe visits friends and you know pulls away from us for like a weekend because mommy's not okay. So it's also being your own support system, not mm. expect, not waiting for validation, especially in the black community, because I want someone to say, oh, fortunate you're depressed and give me that ticket, then I can say, oh, let me take care of myself. But when I see the things that I think, no, I haven't been here before a while. Mm. This is not okay. It's okay for me to seek help. It's okay for me to go to that clinic and say, I'm not too sure if I'm depressed or not, mm. but I think I might be. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did your son uh, come back to staying with you, if he did? He did. Um, he came back, I think he was... Um, about three years old. Mm, mm. So he stayed there for like a year or two. I think, I'm not too sure, three or four years old. Mm. And um, I'm grateful that they did that for me because I was able, my son, I think if he stayed with me, he would have also got to experience this mother was not there. Mm. Because I mean, I was sad all the time. I was crying all the time. So he would have had a mother was crying all the time. Mm. So it did him good. Um, 
to, to sort of protect him. So he came back and, um, yeah, I think they're wonderful kids, they're teenagers, so, mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. And have you let go of some of the guilt that you were carrying about what you were not able to do yeah. when, you know, your, your daughter was, was a baby? That was step number one, because mm. that was the whole thing that was blocking me from giving my daughter love mm. and embrace her. So I was like, I'm not sure if I give myself validation or what, but I said, I'm leaving this here right now. This guilt is not helping me. Mm. And instead it's keeping me from my child. And every day my child is growing up. So I can't postpone it and say, I let go of the guilt tomorrow or the week after. Mm. You know, I had to let go of it then. It, and it was hard. It mm. was hard. It was, it was a practical exercise. And there was conflict within myself where I'm like, I'm going to hold on to my child. I'm going to give her a hug. It's hard. But emotionally, it's hard. Physically, it isn't. Um, and there's this conflict within me where my subconscious is like, you're, you're not able to do this because you never got this. Mm. Mm. You know, you need validation to do this. And I would tell myself, I'm giving this because I'm doing this for my daughter. And mm. I'm glad I did. So where are you today, fortunate? Mentally, emotionally, all of that? I'm in a great space. Um, one thing that they told me um, when I overdosed, the lady said to me, like, fortunate, the fact that you've tried to take your life means that you have a problem. Mm. So just keep inside of where you are. So I keep inside of my mental state every day. When I wake up, when I go to sleep, I make sure that I know where I'm at. Mm. So if I need to, to get help, I don't have to wait till I'm drowning to get mm. the help. Um, I'm, I think I'm a great mother. I'm a single parent. Um, got divorced uh, from my kid's father, got married, got widowed. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a single parent and it's important for me to make sure that I take care of myself, especially mentally, because um, I think I'm the only parent that my kids model mm -hmm. in terms of how you deal with life after so many incidents. So it's important that I um, keep that in check. And I think I'm doing really, really well. I think I am. I can never be too confident, but I think... I put in the work every day and I'm satisfied, yeah. Mm. And where are you today? I read something the other day that said, I'm where my feet are mm. and that's, that's how I am. Like mm. today is a good day, I'm mm. going to take it in its strides. Yes. If tomorrow is not a great day, I'm going to deal with that. Mm. Um, and I think one of the things that fuels the guilt and the depression is looking too far ahead into the future, mm. worrying about how am I going to manage taking my child to private schools, blah, blah, blah. But I'm in a good space. I'm where I'm, my feet are. Ladies, thank you so, so much for joining me today and just for being so open about what I consider such a silent suffering that so many women go through. And I hope that, um, you know, there are women or mothers that are watching that can take something out of this that they're not alone. Mm which is the biggest thing, but also that they're able to go and find the help and uh, to reach out where they can. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Hashtag unpacked with Rile Bukhile. Thank you so much for joining us and for engaging in such a big and important conversation. Mothers, sending so much love and light to you. You are doing one of the hardest jobs in this world. Do not suffer in silence. Seek out the help. And I hope you're able to take something out of the experiences that were shared today. But also pat yourself on the back. You're doing well. Many of you are doing the absolute best that you can. Thank you so much again for joining us. Have a good night. Next time on Unpacked. I had my uncle, my mother passed away. Mm. So I had to go and stay with my uncle. He already told me that, what are you going to do in Brazil? You are going to fetch the stuff to bring it to South Africa. And then the trouble started there. And then police came unto me. They said, we got the cocaine and it's the real one. We are going to prison.
Thank you so much for watching Unpacked with Rilip Khile Mamoja. Make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.